I can't die inauthentic. I can't continue to hide behind this, this logo and this packaging. And I need to share the truth of who I am. Welcome to the One Girl Revolution podcast. It's your girl, Kate Bryan. One Girl Revolution is a multimedia platform, a podcast, and a nonprofit dedicated to highlighting the stories of inspiring women and girls who are changing the world through their lives. Please subscribe to the One Girl Revolution podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at One Girl Revo. We're on YouTube at One Girl Revolution, and you can find all of our social media links podcast episodes, videos, and so much more on our website at onegirlrevolution.com. That's the number one girlrevolution.com. On this week's episode of the One Girl Revolution podcast, I am so incredibly honored and excited to welcome Melissa Bernstein, co-founder of Melissa and Doug, the toy company, and Lifelines, an online community that helps individuals find purpose, meaning, and self-acceptance. I have always loved Melissa and Doug toys and buy them as gifts for all the children in my life, but I never knew the story behind the toys or the story of the woman behind the toys. Melissa is so incredible and her story will inspire you, challenge you, and give you so much hope. In this episode, Melissa shares her own life story. She talks about how she met her husband and the great story of how they came up with the idea for Melissa and Doug toys and what made them run with the idea. Melissa also talks about her struggles through life with depression and perfectionism and how she's helping others through her new online platform, Lifelines. She talks about her own search for meaning and how she's using her own experiences and her own story to help others. And so much more. We talk about so much in this episode. This episode is jam-packed full of so much goodness. You are going to love Melissa and you're going to love this episode. So without further ado, here's Melissa. Melissa, welcome to the One Girl Revolution podcast. I am so honored and humbled to be here. I am so honored and excited to have you on. I want to talk about Melissa and Doug. Many people would know Melissa and Doug's toys. I know I've been a big fan for a long time. I want to talk about lifelines. And that's actually how I reached out to you as I saw a couple of interviews with you and your husband about the incredible work that you're doing with Lifeline. So I want to talk about all the different things. But before we get into that, I want to start by asking you, who is a one girl revolution in your life? Who's a woman or girl that's inspired you? Wow, that's kind of a deep question when it comes to me, because honestly, I really have had a very difficult time with female relationships in my life. And I think I really haven't had anyone so far um, who has inspired me. And that's why I'm really intent on becoming sort of a role model and a mentor for so many young women now. Um, I have four daughters. I mentor so many um, young entrepreneurs and I have a sweet spot for women. And I really want to pay that forward because I think for myself, I'm only now just beginning to develop female relationships. It's always been really challenging for me. I'm so glad that you answered that question that way, because I'm sure there are so many women and girls that are listening. And I think we all have moments too, right? Where you might have somebody in your life and um, then you run into difficulties or you think somebody's your friend and then they're not. And so I think we've all dealt with that in different ways. And so thank you for being so honest and straightforward about that. Um, I would like to rewind and talk about a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and just a little bit about your life growing up and, and a little bit about you. Sure. So I moved around a bit as a child. Uh, and I think, you know, I was born definitely a very heady, churning, pondering, introspective, creative. And uh, I always felt that something was wrong with me because of that, because I didn't have this ebullient personality and I wasn't extroverted. And, you know, we, we lived in my early years, we had a cul-de-sac at the end of our street. And, and it was like that, in a sense, that idyllic childhood where people would go down and there and play. But I always was like kind of on the fringes. I was always like looking from behind a tree at them, kind of wishing I could be, you know, effortlessly able to engage and, and much more someone who didn't express through her mouth, but expressed through her hands, whether I was writing, I was a musician. uh, I loved to be in nature. I loved to craft. So I think my, my form of self-expression was definitely creative and not through speaking. 
One thing that I had seen in one of the interviews that you start, you've started sharing recently is just how you would write little prompts about things uh, throughout your life. And you kept journals of these little like phrases or poems or different things. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I've written rhyming verse since the, my earliest recollection, and they just like appear in my head and they're really, um, that's why our business is called lifelines because lifelines are what they ended up being the lines of verse that kind of saved my life. They were my best friends. They answered all my questions. They were my comfort. Many have said they're kind of like prayers. And I think they really reflected the full spectrum of who I was that I didn't want to show the world. And I didn't even want to accept in myself. Hmm. So, you know, I wrote these and some of them were, you know, really about all the things I pondered, they were about um, dying, what happens after we die. Uh, they were about the beauty of the world and, and the beauty of nature. And they really reflect, I, I have probably more verses than toys. You know, I probably created close to 10,000 toys. I probably have 15,000 verses, literally like every day I still write a handful mm -hmm. of them. That's beautiful. And what a, what a beautiful thing to, to, continue on you know it's our legacy lives on through our writings or I know I still have writings that my grandfather had written years and years ago and it's something that I can look back on and now um, you know hopefully my kids will be able to look back on and so that's that's something really special that you've that you've kept and I encourage everybody who's listening you know find whatever your outlet is and if it's writing sit down and write if your outlet is speaking do that um, but find what your outlet is so after childhood, you, did you go on to college? Like, tell me a little bit about, about your adult life or your transition into adult life. Because I was such a, sort of a, a misfit in my, in my head. And I, I suffered what I now call um, from existential depression, which is this deep meaning crisis. And I basically, my whole life sort of asked the question, why am I here? What is the meaning of life? If we are just going to ultimately expire? And what am I meant to do during my brief time here? And I'm talking from the time I was like two or three, these questions um, wouldn't stop sort of barraging my brain. And my life became an exercise in trying to quell those voices so I could just try to be normal. And I think because I couldn't answer those questions, and when I showed a bit of that despair to those around me, they, they said things like, either you're too, you're weird, don't do that, you're a child, go out and play, like be like other children. So I got this sense really that I wasn't accepted as who I was. So my authentic self became completely repressed, submerged, and I basically adopted a facade that I showed to the world, which was, was two things. It was pleasing because when I was a good girl and I did everything right and I helped others and I was the shoulder to lean on, like I felt needed and validated. And then the worst of the two was perfectionism, which became um, a, a, an overwhelming force that took over. And it was perfectionism in everything, perfectionism in how I looked, perfectionism in how I acted and being socially accepted and perfectionism in my pursuits and my, my work, which we know, at least I know now, um, is a feudal race because we are human and humans are imperfectly perfect. And if perfectionism is your goal, you will ultimately crash because we can't get hundreds on everything as I found out in college. So I think, you know, I was, I was like a simmering cauldron of anxiety ready to boil over, but no one would ever guess because on the surface, I was like a swan gliding through the water, like, hey, everything's great. I'm perfect. You know, not able to show uh, any sort of chink in my armor. Mm. So I went on, you know, to college and, um, and, you know, started, started okay, because as long as I achieved, as long as I like got the, the shiny gold stars, I, my, my, my ego was satiated and I was okay. And I, I started off, you know, everything was great, but as college kept going on, I, I suffered two um, oof, really devastating failures at the same time. One was social. I, um, 
Again, I didn't see or accept myself as who I was. And I rushed for a sorority, had my, my sight set on the one that was the opposite directly 180 degrees polar opposite of who I was. It was like the tall, leggy, beautiful Barbie like females who came from really um, privileged backgrounds and was the opposite of, of who I was. And I had sororities who wanted me who were just like me, but I, I couldn't accept that because I didn't like, I despised the, who I was. So I despised anyone who thought I was like them when I wasn't like them. I was like these other people who rejected me, um, rightly so. And then simultaneously, I suffered an academic breakdown because I was unable to complete a paper because I put so much pressure on myself and had to accept an incomplete in a class, not even a B, just an incomplete that I could make up. And the two, um, I really crashed in college and I had a, a complete sort of breakdown, but I didn't share it with anyone. And I, I got through it sort of on my own, but again, all these lurking demons um, throughout my, my being that I needed to really reconcile. That there seems to be something in the culture and in the world. And I think more than ever with social media, I always talk about how social media is like the best of things, but also, uh, can be the worst of things, but there's this like push for all of us to like be perfect and not show anything about ourselves. It's difficult. And that's what I, I love so much about the work that you're doing with lifelines. And I think it's so powerful to see so many people sharing their own, like the reality, the real struggles that we're all dealing with. Um, but there seems to be a lot of pressure on, on young people too, where it's like, be perfect, get perfect grades. Like don't stand out. Don't be, you know, your authentic self. Don't be your unique self, right? Like fit into this little box, go be in the sorority that, you know, will make you look more perfect. And there's just so much pressure and I don't know how to change that. I don't know how to circumvent that. I know that what you're doing with lifelines and getting people to share their stories and creating spaces for people to share their authentic stories and their struggles um, is, definitely, is definitely a space for that. How did you end up getting from that point, that crash and burn point to, and I know it's life is a journey. I know there are a lot of different chapters and I know we're not going to talk about everything here, but was there like a suddenly moment where you just were like, I can't do this anymore. I need to figure out who I am, or I need to figure out why this is happening. Was there a moment that just kind of changed your life? That's a great question. I, you know, I, I call them dot moments and they're these profound moments in our lives. We might not even know them when they happen, but looking back, you can connect them. And there were definitely so, so many. And by the way, to go back to your last question about what we can do, the only thing we can do is show our authenticity and show our authentic selves, selves, which is why, by the way, I go and I do everything without makeup even because like I've gone the other extreme and not that that's right. And I, if I had more time, I probably would put on makeup, but I'm just trying to show like have having gone from someone who was trying so hard to be someone I wasn't to now saying, this is who I am, like take it or leave it. And I want to show everyone that despite the fact that I have achieved pretty much everything I ever dreamed of and more and have every shiny gold star I could ever hope for. I mean, I have an adoring husband. I have six children. I have this business that's still growing. Like, you know, the, the material trappings, every single one you could imagine, like that doesn't fill the inner void. If you don't love and accept yourself and truly like embrace yourself as who you are, those outside things, they're out there and they do nothing to, to, to make us whole inside. So, um, and I, I've seen that, I've been there and there was no more to get in terms of material possessions. And I've had, finally, I had to make that journey inward. So the dot moments, there were a couple. One came when Doug and I, who were just dating at the time, uh, decided to form Melissa and Doug. And, you know, one of my biggest epiphanies was, you know, I've always created my form of self-expression is creativity. It's, it's making tangible form of the chaos that reigns supreme in my brain. And I always created from the time I was two, but what I created was always really dark and despairing. And because it was so dark and despairing, 
I never, literally never shared it with anyone else. So I had thousands of little scraps of paper of verses and I had songs I wrote and I had journal writings, but they were all pondering like the meaning of life and really dark stuff. And I realized they never brought me solace because I could never share them and, and impact someone else through them. So when I saw through Melissa and Doug, just by accident, because I don't have any design background, that I was actually able to take that same darkness that created all those dark things and channel it into light and toys, no less, that had the ability to like spark a child's imagination and bring them joy. Like, is that the, the biggest irony of my life? I, I felt like I could breathe fresh air for the very first time. And that was like such a, a revelation that I wanted to scream it from the rooftops that we can take that very same darkness and actually, and for me, it was literally, I see everything in visually in a metaphor. I saw it as this water faucet and I had had the, the light faucet turned off and only the dark faucet on. And I was taking all this despair and channeling it into darkness, kind of the, the metaphor of the, 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 you know, creative, who's just so um, afflicted. Uh, and then I realized, actually, it's my choice. I can turn off the dark faucet. And that was my existential, like, meaning. I choose. I can turn off that dark faucet. I can turn on the light faucet and just channel the very same uh, material into light, bright toys. So that um, became really my salvation. And it started to be that, huh, I've been searching for meaning. Maybe, I mean, it is just toys, but, but maybe that is kind of part of my purpose. Um, and then, you know, that's what I've done for 32 years. But ultimately, that wasn't enough because I had, now I had turned off the dark faucet and I was only light. And I was channeling, I was making toys, I was championing, championing open-ended play. And it was incredible. Like, it was awesome. But the truth was, I was still only showing half of who I was. I was showing the light, bright side and the truth, the like the ugly secret was that it was really a whole lot of darkness fueling those beautiful light, bright toys. And I was denying the fact that I was the full emotional spectrum. I had a lot of darkness. Um, so that cry, and it wasn't something it, I even was conscious of. Everything for me has been repressed and denied. Like I never understood any of this until sort of that cry of my authentic soul to be seen grew so loud. And it started to feel like, I don't know, I could, just was very uncomfortable. And I started to feel like I was as inauthentic as the toys I created sort of in their shiny boxes on a shelf, because I was just like sort of packaging myself in this light, bright box. Um, and there was more to me. It wasn't that that wasn't part of me. Like that is part of me. That's my, my best side, I guess you'd say. But there was a whole lot of other part too. So that's when I was like, you know what? I, I, can't, I can't die inauthentic. I can't continue to hide behind this, this logo and this packaging. And I need to share the truth of who I am. And that was kind of a few dots started to connect. I started to understand that my, I call it a blurse that, that my curse of this heavy stigmatizing personality was actually the reason I could create from white space. And I started to kind of put together um, some of these dots and, and have this epiphany that I needed to, to share my truth. Yeah. Sorry. Very long. Winded. No, but it's so true. What you've experienced, we're multifaceted beings and there's so much pressure to still be perfect or do everything right. Or, you know, even once I know when, when you get married and have kids, I'm getting married in May. And so it's like, I know that there's pressure there. It's like, you want your kids to be perfect and you start like pushing yeah. that on them. But the reality yeah. is, is we're all these multifaceted beings and they're going to be dark moments. And some of us have wounds and things from our childhood or from other places that we carry with us, you know, and there's always going to be this little like dark imprint, but it's learning how to challenge it. And it's learning how to talk about it. And, you know, that's why it's so important what you're doing with lifelines is like giving people this space, this outlet to, to learn and think about themselves and then being able to feel the freedom to yeah. share their authentic stories. Yeah. Exactly. That is exactly right. Until we 
have the courage and it takes courage, you know, and I think, you know, people have used a lot of adjectives to describe me and I'm, I'm very much like, uh, my, my grandma had this thing called a Kenahura, an evil eye, and you can never like say anything good about yourself. Or when people say something good about you, you have to go like this. So like, I never, I, I never allow compliments, but the one word that I think brought me to tears for kind of the first year of lifelines was brave because the truth is it does take a whole lot of courage to say like, I don't really care anymore what someone thinks of me if they don't accept me as who I truly am. And, you know, when you come out and say something like I have an existential depression, like I, I laugh, I, I would have to laugh because there were kind of three reactions sort of the first year of lifelines. And, you know, one was people would, and I, I walk a lot every day. One of my lifelines is I, I walk through like our neighborhood and people would see me and I, I am pretty observant. So I'd see from far away, they'd like recognize me and they'd hide their head and they'd kind of like, like quickly walk away. So those were the ones that were like terrified that I was contagious and like, oh my gosh, existential depression. She's going to give it to me. I don't even know what it is, but she's going to give it to me. Get far away. Then there were the ones that would look at me and just go like this. And they'd come over and they'd kind of go, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and you know, that's, that's the thing you're, I laugh because I, I now know like the things you, you shouldn't say. And like, I'm so sorry means like, I'm so sorry you're the way you are. Right. <laughs> um, but they don't know what to say. And those, I, I love them because they're trying so hard. And, um, and I would be like, oh, thank you. That's so sweet. You know, that's amazing. But I'd laugh because like, they're just sorry for me. Like, I'm sorry you are who you are. And then there were those who like came running over and they're like, whoa, you've got it going on. Like, this is amazing. Good for you. Like, you, you know, and, the, and it was kind of like one of those, one of those three. And the great news is I was fine with all three. Like, you know, by the time I did this, cause I was so old. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing lifelines is I don't want people to have to be middle age when they, when they have the courage to come out, like uh, by that, by that point, it, it honestly, it doesn't even matter one bit because like, I am who I am. Finally, I can say that and like, accept me as I am or not in either way, like I'm okay. Donate to One Girl Revolution's nonprofit organization to help us continue our work, highlighting inspiring women and girls that are changing the world through their lives, promoting their work and their organizations, and building a powerful and positive force out in the world dedicated to empowering women, their voices, and their stories. Donate at onegirlrevolution.com backslash donate. That's the number one girlrevolution.com backslash donate. Well, Melissa, first of all, you are not old. You're amazing. You look so beautiful. Um, yeah. But I think it's like, it's so important, our journey. And we need to recognize that the life is a journey and so many things probably that you went through. Like I believe I'm a firm believer that timing is everything. And so many things that you've gone through in order to lead you to lifelines. It's almost like you needed all that time to get it to where, to be what it is today, you know, what it is now. And so I think it's important for us to respect our own life journey. And I know that's something that I'm always thinking about with my own life is like, what are different things that have led me to doing what I'm doing now with one girl revolution? And why did that spark? And why do I care so much? You know, why do you care so much? And those are things in all of our lives that we all experience if we just take a moment to stop and reflect. And so, um, yeah, I think what you're doing is incredible. I think it doesn't happen until it's ready to happen. Otherwise, you know, one of my favorite concepts is spiritually bypassing. It's when you intellectualize it, but you really don't deal with the feelings. And, you know, many people believe they've dealt with their demons because they can talk it through. But the truth is they have not gone inward and really dealt with the feelings. And I believed intellectually I had dealt with my, my demons. And I can tell you, I wasn't even close. I had repressed those feelings to such an extent that I thought I didn't have them until I decided to go inward. And not only did I have them, but they were raging. They were like a cauldron of seething emotion. Um, and now I, I know, uh, and I, I speak to people every day who are, you know, they're 70, 75, 80, and they're like, I'm just starting this now. And they feel such regret. And I'm like, if you can be free, and, and accept yourself for one day, 
then that is enough. Like as long as you get there, most people don't even get there in their lives. So if you're getting there and you're 75, 80, you know, congratulations, like that you got there because it, it took you that long. So I believe it isn't until the pain and the suffering are so great that you are willing to endure the inward journey that it will take to relieve it. You don't, you don't do it. And that's what happened to me. You know, my, 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 my crash came one day when the pain of resisting and denying and repressing became so great that I was like, I can't, I can't do it alone anymore. Like, and that was the day I sort of admitted, like, I need professional help. I can't keep doing this, but I can't make that journey on my own. Like, I'll never be able to do it. Um, I need someone to like be next to me. Uh, And that's, that was like also a a big dot moment when I said, I need, um, I need a therapist. I need professional help to like figure out what feelings are, how to feel, how to accept myself. And it's been a long journey. And just have somebody still ongoing. To, yeah. So I have somebody to talk to that isn't like in your immediate posse too. I think it's like nice to have somebody that's not your husband, you know, not your spouse, not your kids, not, you know, somebody in your immediate circle. We all need that. We all need someone yeah. to just be like, Hey, or cause also sometimes they just back us up, right? Like, am I thinking about this in the right way? Or this is what I think is going on and to have somebody support us through that. So Um, yeah, I'm just so grateful for you sharing your story and for all the great work that you're doing. I want to rewind for a second because I want to know the story of how you and Doug met, because I don't know that story. And then I also want to ask you about the conversation when you guys decided to start Melissa and Doug, because I'm sure that there, I'm sure there were many conversations, but what was like the conversation that launched it? Sure. Oh my gosh. So We actually, I mean, in a strange way, we kind of met through our parents because our parents knew each other and they always thought we'd be like a good match. Uh, But we were both dating other people at the time and completely disinterested. We were like, thanks, mom, dad, you know, no. Um, But I was a junior in high school, actually. I'm, I'm sorry, a junior in college. And I had just come back from studying abroad. And I guess maybe his relationship had ended and out of the blue, he just decided to call me and I had never met him. So they had, we were in different years. We never went to school together. So out of the blue, he just calls me. He's like, this is Doug Bernstein. I'm like, Doug Bernstein, like the Doug Bernstein, like of the parents that my, my, you know, my parents know. And we ended up talking on the phone for, I think like four hours And then he said some cheesy line, like, would you like to continue this over dinner? (laughs) And I was like, okay, sure. So um, we ended up going out to dinner and like, that's the story. Um, And I was 19 and uh, still in college. So for my, my last year, he was already, he was out of college for my last year. He visited me like almost every weekend. And, um, and then we started on traditional careers. He was in advertising and I, this is like one of my other crazy stories. I'm a, right. I'm a creative, like every ounce of my being is creative. So what do I do? I go into investment banking (laughs) (laughs) because again, it was the hottest, most sought after position. And of course I was all about trappings and ego and how it looked. And I determined I'm going to get one of those one out of a thousand jobs. So um, that became like my, my goal. And uh, then I was there. And for about two days, I was like, woohoo, I made it. I made it. And then I was like a flower without sunlight and water. So um, we were both, I was really, um, I was really in a dark place because I knew how many folks loved numbers and numbers to them were were magic, right? They came alive and they could do amazing things. But for me, they were just boring old numbers. Like notes speak to me, words, I can morph them products, not numbers. So I started to become really depressed. And Doug, although he loved what he did, he also, he's like a leader. He's a visionary and he was working, you know, um, confined. So we were both like, there has to be a reason to get out of bed each morning. We have to find something we can do that touches the world in a greater way. Um, and we decided we would go away 
for a weekend to a bed and breakfast in the Berkshire Mountains of Massachusetts. And we would not leave. <laughs> Most people would do other things if they go away for a weekend. We were like, we're not going to leave until we have our, our business that we're doing together. And we were just dating. We had been dating for three years at this point. Uh, and we immediately, both of us, honed in on children because all our parents are involved in education. And we love, I mean, we have six children now and I would have had more if I could. Um, like we love children. And we, th we thought, we were thinking really sort of uh, a white space. We were thinking like, what can we do that truly will stand the test of time? And like, if we impact it, it has the, uh, the potential to like leave a legacy. And we were immediately like, children, hello. Um, so we decided, and then we had to figure out what we were doing with children. And we had a lot of different ideas. We, we thought a lot about creating a school, a very different school that didn't stress rote learning and was much more about life skills. And, and we still think that's an amazing idea um, that we never pursued. Uh, but then we honed in on sort of products because the 80s were when like Cabbage Patch Kids and the licensing was starting to really get big. And we started to think like, where are all those timeless classic toys? Like where are the, the puzzles and the blocks and the books that had texture? Um, and they, they really didn't exist. And when they did, they were mostly European, beautiful and very, very expensive. So that was sort of like our, hmm, Maybe we can um, create timeless, open-ended, simple, classic products, but do them with a twist that um, reinvigorates them and brings them back to life and at price points that are so accessible that everybody can afford them. Yeah. And that it's just continued to grow. I know you've designed all, you've designed all the toys, right? I really have. Yeah. Okay. And that's just, I mean, I'm the, I'm the, the spark. And then I have, so I see it in my head, finished. And then I have a beautiful team that helps bring it to fruition. Because the mm -hmm. truth is, I'm not an engineer. I'm not an illustrator. Like, I can't, I'm nothing without my team. And it's continued to grow. Like, what's so interesting, because a lot of people right now would think, oh, well, with technology, with all the other things, computers that Melissa and Doug would like phase out at some point, but you guys have just gotten bigger and bigger. And I feel like I'm seeing Melissa and Doug toys everywhere, like literally every store it's going. So how is that, how has it grown um, throughout the years? That's a great question, especially since you're not a parent. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I have tons of talking. cousins. I have okay. got children and Melissa and Doug, I'm not just saying this because I'm talking to you, but it is, I always look for Melissa and Doug toys for these Thanks. kids because like, I want them to learn and I want them to have like cool toys that I grew up with, you know, even with the puzzles and things and little kids are so sensory too. So even getting like the little puzzles with the fuzzy things that are like things that are just like, you know, they love colors. And so, um, yeah, I just, I love everything you guys are doing. Thank you. Well, I think the first thing I'll say is when you do something truly mission-based that comes from your heart. And for me, every toy is like giving birth to a child. So I put a little piece of myself in every single thing I create. And, and I truly believe it has a heartbeat. Like to me, it's alive. So I think that's part of it. Like that we've done it truly out of mission for 33 years and like nothing has taken us off the path of creating open-ended toys that are a catalyst to a child's imagination. Like, so that's part of it. And we've never done it for anything but that. Um, but also I think even in the face and the rise of technology, I do think parents know in their hearts that childhood is about boundless freedom. And it's really not about being bombarded by stimuli from a screen. And of course the data has become stronger and stronger toward the damages and the detriment of too much technology at a young age. And I think, you know, we've, we've aligned with the American Academy of Pediatrics and their campaign was like an hour and a half or less. Otherwise you could begin to have an addiction similar to drugs you know, um, dopa your dopamine level starts to rise and, and it stays elevated. And then when you, when it comes down, you feel really low and it creates that addictive, um, that addictive, you know, loop that, that is so detrimental. So I think, I think 
folks have known that even in the face of wanting their kids to be coders at age two, like these simple classic toys are really important. So I think even during those years, and there were years before sort of the ills of technology came out and everyone was like deluge towards screen-based toys, we were still growing. So people were very worried about us. And even our own, you know, our own board was like, what's going to happen? And we were like, hey, this is our thing. If people don't want us, then so be it. Like, we're not going to, we're not going to make apps. Like, it's not who we are in our DNA. And I think, but I had to change a bit. You know, I did have to create toys with a few more, like, things with pizzazz. You know, a little more, few, like, I, I call them sort of, um, low skill, high impact, little bells and whistles to intrigue kids. And, and it changed, you know, 30 years ago, I could make a simple lacing shoe and it was maybe enough today. Nah, I'd want it to have, you know, a couple other features, not technology, um, but a couple other features that just, um, engage that child in the experience. And it, it became more fun for me, to be honest, because I, I like to elevate my own game and, and come up with things that really can spark a child to um, imagine the extraordinary. Yeah, well, it might, yeah, it must be fun to go through all the different, you think about the different years that Melissa and Doug has been around and just trying to be creative and innovative and think about like, okay, what, especially as your kids are getting older too, it's nice when you have little kids and you can be like, okay, this is what they like to do, but actually having to, to really dig and figure out, okay, What's going on in the culture right now? What are things that kids like? How can Melissa and Doug kind of um, get into that? To be honest, it was a real exercise in, which I didn't even understand in mindfulness and grounding. Because if I got two in my head and I started to think like in a way, this entire company is dependent on these ideas. And if they do well, I mean, you start to have like hundreds and hundreds of employees with families to feed it can be like, you know, it, it would, I would become so untethered. So I had to keep every day. And for me, it's a lot about intuition, which is a very woo woo kind of thing, but I don't use a lot of research. I don't use a lot of market data. I do my own, you know, I'm always looking, but I, I have to trust that, that gut instinct. Um, and when I didn't, it never went well. So it, it's, it's hard because you have a lot of people talking in your ear and telling you what they think you should do. And, you know, a lot of times I just had to breathe and like go to that place where all innovation lies, sort of that mind's eye, and just allow that to guide me. Melissa, where do you hope that Melissa and Doug goes from here? I know that you guys have come so far but where do you hope that it goes? You hope that Melissa and Doug, I'm sure you hope that Melissa and Doug will always be around, um, that your legacy will live on through these great products. But where do you hope that Melissa and Doug goes from here? I just think, I, I hope it allows kids to experience the magic of childhood as many as possible. Because I think, you know, Melissa and Doug, similar to Lifelines, <clears throat> is really educating parents. Because I think so many parents believe that, you know, technology, rote activities, scheduled activities is the way their kids will get ahead. When the truth is so much the opposite. You know, the truth is it's really, it's really not even about our toys. It's really about just allowing kids to be and to be bored and to go outside and to, you know, play with rocks and to discover and, and true innovation comes from allowing your mind to just be free. Uh, those are where the innovators of tomorrow come. And you don't need any toys. And I'm the first one to say that. Like our toys only come in when you don't have that ability to maybe tap into your imagination because kids don't even learn how to do that. And our toys can provide a spark to do that. But the truth is the toy should disappear the minute you're in your imagination because then you're free. Like then imagine the the impossible, like anything's possible once you're in your imagination. So I think um, I just want more children to experience the joy of open-ended play. And the more we can get out there and get our message out there, hopefully the more parents we will convince, the more educators we will convince, and the more children we will touch through that ability. Because once you know how to find the extraordinary in the ordinary and go into your imagination, 
you gain agency over your life. And suddenly, like you are gritty, you're resilient, you're um, a problem solver, you're an innovator. And, and that's why, you know, despite all my, my mental and emotional challenges, because I was given a childhood and I was completely on my own and I had to fill my blank canvas with magic every single day, or it was blank at the end of the day, and nobody was helping me. Um, I am, you know, incredibly gritty and resilient. So I think in the face of all I've gone through, you know, that, that ability to, to devise my own path forward came from, from a ch- my childhood. What's so interesting as you're speaking there, I'm thinking about what you're doing with lifelines and there's kind of a similar thread there, right? Like there's a freedom that comes yes. when you can actually just be and be present and learn about what's going on in your imagination or in your mind or quieting the voices. Like, I think that that's so important for all of us to like step aside and say, okay, even for little kids, but it transitions into our adult life too, is we need to still find those moments for imagination, for creativity, for just being simply being in our body. It's exactly the same. So, you know, at Melissa and Doug, we're really, um, sparking the imagination through open-ended play. Now we're sparking the journey inward to, to inner space that my journey is called the journey to inner space. We're creating that space so that the same thing, right? We can be our best selves. We can be free of all our burdens. We can untether from the mind and go into our hearts. And it's giving tool, giving tools to people, just like the open-ended toy is a catalyst to the imagination. Our tools are a catalyst to that inward journey to self-discovery and self-acceptance. And it's very much the same. Have you subscribed to the One Girl Revolution podcast? We have new episodes coming out every week and you don't want to miss them. Subscribe to the One Girl Revolution podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now. Melissa, for people that are listening, can you tell me about the suddenly moment when you decided to start Lifelines and tell me about the great work that you're doing? Sure. So I started to hear this inner voice, right? That was like, you're being inauthentic, come out as yourself. And I started to um, have a few dots connect that showed me that actually the things in myself that I believed were my greatest um, weaknesses were actually the reason I could create. So I saw this blurse, the blessing in the curse. And I want, once I realized that, I wanted to shout it from the rooftops. So I had listened to a, a podcast actually with this guy, Jonathan Fields, and it's called The Good Life Project. And it was my favorite podcast. It had all my favorite people um, like Glennon Doyle and Liz Gilbert. And um, I, I think as I was getting the courage to tell my own story, I needed, they were like my, my sangha, my, my spiritual um, community that was giving me the courage. Like they were like, you can do this. You can tell your story. So I determined that I was going to go on his podcast and tell my story, even though I had never met him and I wrote him a blind letter. Anyway, I ended up going on the podcast. And for the first time, like my, my family didn't even know, I shared that I have this existential depression. It's the source of all my creativity. Anyway, I received hundreds and hundreds of letters like the most beautiful drops of gold raining down from the heaven letters um, that made me realize two things. Actually, in the end, it was three things and they were the impetus for lifelines. So the first was that I wasn't alone. And those of us that feel, and I don't mean alone, like I have a beautiful husband, I have family, but those of us who feel so different, and we, we feel like it's our, our core belief that we're alone and no one will really ever accept us in our darkness as well as our light. So I had this sense that I'm not alone, but no one really knows the real me. So I realized that wasn't true because all the letters said, oh my gosh, you just gave, you just verbalized my life experience. And again, and again, and again, and I would be sobbing as I read them. And I was like, I'm not alone. So I felt like I needed to show so many others that they weren't alone because this was one podcast. Um, Two, uh, I wanted to show others that we all have the capacity to channel our darkness into light and make meaning. And that's the the existential perspective that 
we all have darkness. We all have these demons that we're facing. Everyone has something, but we have a choice. We can either let those, you know, those, that darkness submerge us, or we can choose to find our form of self-expression and channel it into light. And the people who contacted me said, the only difference between us is you've found your pathway out. I haven't. So I felt like, oh my gosh, like I need to help these folks find their pathway out of darkness into light. And then the third um, was that until we stop racing outside ourselves, because we're all looking externally for external uh, material, you know, wins to fill our inner void. And that doesn't happen. That's, that can't happen until we decide to stop racing, pause and go the other direction and make that journey inward and really sort of engage in that self-discovery exercise to accept ourselves in totality. Until we do that, we will really never be able to truly be at peace and find that blissful freedom. So I created uh, this journey called the journey to inner space. That was my journey um, because I was my whole life trying to gain space between my head that was kind of a prison of doom and my heart that just wanted to engage in expressive um, liberation. So uh, that was sort of the impetus for Lifelines. And when you li launch Lifelines, so tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing with Lifelines, how people can get in touch, like how you connect with people, just so everybody who's listening can, can follow along. Sure. So Lifelines, just like everything I've done and, and that we've done, and by the way, I'm doing this with Doug, which is like the most incredible thing ever to have the chance to do a second um, venture with him is like extraordinary. Uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's become really an ecosystem. And basically what we're doing is we're empowering people. We're offering people tools that help them to engage in a daily deliberate practice to be their best selves and unlock their full potential because too many folks are stuck. They are literally unable to find meaning in their lives because it's scary. And change is really against what our bodies want and our brains want, which is homeostasis. So engaging in a daily deliberate practice, most people don't want to do. That's why diets don't work. That's why exercise programs don't last. Like we're, we're fighting a tsunami of homeostasis. So we're doing a whole bunch of things. We, we are creating a practice right now. I'm, I'm writing a workbook with um, an incredible PhD uh, about this practice that's become my practice for living my best life. We're going to take that practice um, wherever people will have us and bring it in to corporations and organizations and try to empower people because it's for everyone. Literally anyone can use this practice. And part of the practice is actually products. We're creating uh, tangible products that people can use to help ground themselves in the present moment and through their senses. So it's really fun to create products for adults after having created products for children for three decades. Um, and then, you know, we're going to really offer a community to support everyone. And, and I've done workshops for over a year uh, in, in all kinds of things, in talking about perfectionism and talking about the myth of balance, which by the way, is a bad word. You can't balance. Um, and just all these topics, loneliness and martyrdom that people don't usually talk about, at least in as brutal honesty as I do. So I think I'm trying to rip the mask off this facade of uh, Western culture that basically says like, it's all about the pursuit of happiness and you're, you're chasing this elusive dream. And that's why all of us feel uh, feel unacceptable because we never get there. And when we get there, it's not enough because it's external and it's not internal. So we're, we're on the treadmill and we never find peace or happiness. So I, I want to kind of hopefully help people take a shortcut and say, you don't need to, you know, do this for the next 30 years. Like you can begin to make that inward journey today and find, find the, um, the peace you've been seeking. Yeah. I, life, what you're doing with lifelines is so incredible. I'm going to put the, the link in the show notes. so Everybody can get in touch with you guys and follow along what you're doing. Um, I know that it's just going to continue to grow and evolve. And there's so many different resources you guys have. 
And what's so inspiring to me, Melissa, and, and why I really wanted to have you on this podcast is you and Doug could just be sitting by the pool with your feet up and not doing anything, but you have taken, um, you've taken your lives by the horns, I guess, and just been like, you know, what are we called to in this next chapter? You know, what, how can we be giving back to people? We give back to children through our toys. And it's probably going to be really interesting too, to see as Lifelines continues to grow and evolve. And maybe you already have had experiences like this, where some of the people that you're working with and serving, they actually played with your toys, you know, like how things come full circle um and so i just can't wait to see where lifelines goes from here thank you that that means so much to me and yeah i think you know i've been seeking meaning since the day i was born and meaning comes through committed engaged action so i could never sit on a beach because i wouldn't feel that i was serving others and finding that meaning so, you know, I, I get my most meaning when I'm talking to, I talk to a lot of young adults, like college age kids who are in the same place I was, you know, when I was in college, which was a complete mess. Uh, and I get no greater, you know, joy at giving them some of the lessons, whether they take them or not, that I wish someone would have given me back then, you know, to say like, it's not about the, this external, like just, just keep remembering and defining who you are and searching for, for your, your people. Uh, you know, I find it when I do that, even when it's one person, cause it is, it's one person at a time, just like it's one toy at a time. Like there's no greater joy for me. Well, I will put the link to Melissa and Doug. I'll put the link oh, to you. Lifelines. Um, also, you have a book we didn't talk about. So you have a self-published book. I will put a link to that so people can check it out. I want to encourage everybody to order that. Um, Melissa, I want to ask you, because I'm always curious about like the driving force. And I feel like I have a pretty good sense of it because of some of the things that you've shared. But I'd love to hear it from you. If you could get to the very root of why you do what you do, what drives you with Melissa and Doug, lifelines. I know some of it's that creativity. What would you say that that root is? It's the search for meaning. I mean, my root has been this, this um, desperate search for meaning and to leave some sort of legacy that makes the world a little better than when I entered it. And, uh, you know, whether that's true in the end or not, that is absolutely what motivates me. And um, I can't stop. You know, I, every day I have new ideas. I have new verses. I want it, to, it's almost like it's too much. Right. And, and there's a chapter in my book called the feudal race, because it is a race because I am racing against time and the clock, but I can't stop. And, um, and, you know, one of my wise mentors, she's an existential philosopher. She says to me, Melissa, doing is your form of being. And I think that was maybe the most validating thing anybody ever said to me, because it's okay. She, she basically said, it's okay. Like if you're channeling and you're creating beautiful things and you're not in your ego, cause I'm not, I'm, I'm just, this, it's just, I have to channel it. Um, she's like, that's your being baby. Keep doing it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I, yeah, I, I, that resonates with me so much and all the different things that I've going on, but um, Melissa, for people that are listening and maybe they're struggling right now, maybe they, they're going through whatever, a dark time, a difficult time. What would you say to those people? And then on the flip side, if someone has a family member or someone they love that's going through a difficult time, what would you say to those, those two groups of people? Wow. You know, it's tough because I'm, I'm not a professional, but I would definitely start by saying you're not alone because I talk with a lot of parents too. Who's, who have kids. And, and I've been there myself. I have six children. Like life is, is not perfect. And if you think, you know, I have a lot of chips off the old block because to be so angsty, right. I'm going to pass that on genetically to my kids. So I always empathize with them. And I always say, I'm right there with you. And I'll, and I'll share stories <laughs> because, you know, and they, that makes them alone. That makes them feel so much better. It makes them feel not alone when they know that, my gosh, here's Melissa. And she's telling me she's going through the exact same thing. Yes, I am. So I think acceptance that life is not supposed to be perfect. This is the, the myth that we are fed, which screws us up our whole lives. 
Like if we knew that, guess what? Every day is going to be really up and down. You're going to have some, some, some peaks and you're going to have some valleys every single day. Like if someone, I'm like, why didn't anyone ever tell me that? You know, my life would have been so much easier. I wouldn't be sweating everything. So I think we're all, unfortunately, we're all going to have tragedies. Like we're all, I mean, we're all like mortal. So I think to know that and to first like be accepting, okay, this is one of those moments of, you know, that I have a moment of joy. I have a moment of despair. This is a moment of despair and I'm going to get through it. Like as, as, as awful as it is, you know, we, we have a choice, right. On how we, we face it. So I think we, determine that we're going to get through it. And then we figure out the best way to do that. And sometimes I'll help people in my layperson way, figure out how to do that. And if they have someone else in their lives who's despairing. I think it's a matter of trusting your intuition, right? I mean, I think sometimes they really need professional help, like immediately, like they're in that. And I've sensed that even with my own kids, like when it goes from, right, you're kind of teetering to like a place where like, you can't do this alone. Knowing that, getting the right type of help if you can, and some people can't even afford the right type of help. Uh, so then they, that's another issue. But I think it's just being conscious and aware and knowing that you're going to try to do the best you can. And in the end, that's really all you can do. You know, you can, you can try to act with the best of your capacities and abilities. And that didn't really answer it because there's no easy answer to that. Well, and everybody's, everybody's story is different. It's hard to give a blanket, a blanket answer to that, but just through everything that you've, that you've gone through and everything that you're doing with lifelines, I just was curious what, yeah. what you thought and I about talk, that. I talk with lots of people every day. You know, if someone calls me and they say, my, my child is in a really dark place. I say, I want to talk to them. And I, I explain, I'm not a professional, but like, I've been there. Like, I know what it's like to feel that nobody really wants to hear you when you say pretty dark things. And I hear them and I say, yeah, I get it. I know, I know where you, I've been there. Believe me, I've been there. And I think once, you know, nobody, nobody wants to feel darkness and nobody wants to think horrible thoughts. So I think a lot of times when you know that someone is there with you and for you and has been there and isn't there anymore, like I can say through my own, you know, holistic practice, like I am, I still vacillate. Don't get me wrong. I can go really low very quickly, but I'm, not, I'm only there briefly. And then I, I come back up. So I think knowing that they can use me as a, as a lifeline um, to, to, and, and know that it's possible to be at the darkest nihilism possible and find your way out. Like hope, I hope that gives them hope too. Yeah. I think even just sharing our stories and you've mentioned that numerous times, like us, us sharing our own stories sometimes can give other people the courage to stand up and share their stories and say, you know, I'm going through that as well, or I've been through a difficult time. So I just think what you're doing with lifelines, obviously with Melissa and Doug is so amazing. And I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast to share your story. I will post, like I said, I will have links to Melissa and Doug, um, of the toys, lifelines, your book. I want to encourage everybody to read it, but before I let you go, Melissa, I always end this podcast on one question. So I'd like to ask you if you could leave women and girls around the world with one message, what would it be? Enjoy the grays. So what that means is I think so many of us as females, we live in the black and the white, you know, it's, it's perfect or it's not, I look great or I don't, I have a good job or I don't. And life is not about that. Life is about the journey, which is the grays. And it's about embracing the full spectrum. So, you know, it's easier said than done, but the more we can be okay with good, not great, you know, fine, and know that that's just all part of it. Yes, you, you might hit a black at, at one peak or, or a white at one peak and a black at another, but the most of life is going to be in the grays. And if you can enjoy the grays, if you can enjoy the journey and the struggles um, and revel in those, I think that's where the beauty lies. 
Mm, I'm sitting here in Detroit and it is gray and rainy. And this morning I woke up and was like, why, why is it not sunny? But I need to enjoy the gray. And I'm going to be thinking about that all day today, Melissa. Melissa, thank you so much for joining the One Girl Revolution podcast. And thank you for all the incredible work that you do. Oh my gosh. Thanks for all you're doing. Thanks for allowing me to, to share my story with your audience. Really appreciate it. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at One Girl Revo. That's the number one girl, R-E-V-O. And you can find more information on One Girl Revolution at onegirlrevolution.com. That's the number one girlrevolution.com.